Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back again. Now, last week, we have studied the blood supply of head and neck. Today, we have studied that we said that the last two terminal branches of external carotid artery are the superficial temporal, which supplies the skin of the scalp and part of the face, and the maxillary artery, which was the terminal branch, terminal branch of it. Now, the maxillary artery, this is the major or the larger of the two terminal branches of the external carotid. As you have seen last week, here I put it here because to study the blood supply of the alveolar arch and the teeth. That is the upper alveolar arch of the maxilla, which carries the upper teeth, and the mandible, the blood supply of the mandible, which carries the lower, lower teeth. This is important. When you become dentist, you should know the details of the blood supply, and then you will study the nerve supply of the teeth and the alveolar, alveolar arch. And that's why. Although we have studied the maxillary, but today we will study it in details and details because the maxillary artery supplies all the alveolar arts and all the teeth. Now, as you have seen last week, the maxillary artery is the largest of the two terminal branches of the of the external carotid artery. Now in this slide, I have the slide number 13 now. Is it clear for all of you? Now here in this, in this slide, you have removed, you see here the ramus of the mandible, the upper part of the ramus of the mandible, the head of the mandible. Only portion of it remains with the coronoid coronoid process to see the infratemporal fossa. This is the infratemporal fossa. We have removed also from the face the masseter, of course, the skin, the superficial fascia, with the parotid gland. Here's the parotid gland. The external carotid artery, the terminal brown portion of it, lies within the parotid gland. So we have removed also the parotid gland and the Oracle to, to explore the maxillary artery. This is the terminal portion of the external carotid artery extending here behind the angle of the mandible when around the posterior border of the ramus of the mandible and enters inside the parotid gland. Here lies the parotid gland. Now within the parotid, the external carotid artery divides into two terminal bronze. The cut one this is the superficial temporal artery, which we have studied. This pass anterior to the auricle, ascend upward superficially into the skull, where it divides into two terminal bronchs, frontal and temporal, for the supply of skin of the skull and face. The other terminal branch is the maxillary, maxillary artery. You see, this is the maxillary artery. This portion of the maxillary artery first, it's in the, in the, within the parotid, parotid gland. It lies the parotid gland and is within the parotid gland. This is the first part of it. Then the second part enters here inside, inside the infratemporal fossa. This is the infratemporal fossa. This is the posterior border of the maxilla, the maxilla. Here lies the infratemporal fossa. And then it leaves the infratemporal fossa by passing through this fissure. This fissure is called the pterygomaxillary fissure, enters into pterygopalatine fossa. This is its third part. And the next slide, and the next slide you see this is the terminal portion of external carotid. This is the first part of the maxillary artery. And here is the second part, and then enters through this fissure. We have removed portion of the maxilla to see the cavity, the nasal cavity, and this is the pterygomaxillary fissure. Here is the pterygopalatine fossa. It lies here within the pterygopalatine fossa, which is the third part of maxillary artery. So the maxillary artery is divided into three, three parts. Again, the maxillary artery, larger terminal branch of the external carotid, 
arises behind mandibular neck embedded within the parotidic gland, passes medial to neck and then superficial or deep to lateral pterygoid within the infratemporal fossa, then passing through pterygo maxillary fissure into pterygo palatine fossa. It's divided into three parts according to its position. First part is called mandibular, which is within the parotid and related to the ramus of the mandible. Second part is called <coughs> the pterygoid part related to the lateral and medial pterygoid muscle or within the infratemporal fossa. The third part is called pterygopalatine, is inside the pterygopalatine fossa. So the three parts of it, first one, it's called mandibular, this is within the parotid. The second part is within the infratemporal fossa, it's the pterygoid part related to the muscles of mastication. Then the third part is the pterygopalatine, which is inside pterygopalatine fossa. Now, generally, the artery supplies, supplies the whole mandible, the maxilla, all teeth of the alveolar arch, upper and lower, supplies muscles of mastication, in addition, supplies roof of the oral cavity, the palate, supplies most of the nasal cavity and gives meningeal brush for inside of the cranial cavity to supply the dura matter. Now, these branches of it, they are branches from each part of the, of the maxillary artery to supply these structures, upper structures, the mandible, maxilla, teeth, muscles of mastication, palate, nose, dura matter, but it doesn't supply <coughs> It doesn't supply the tongue, so it supplies most of the oral cavity, the roof, the floor of the oral cavity, mostly supplied by it, and the uh, old teeth, maxilla, mandible, roof of the oral cavity, that is the palate, and then part of the nasal, nasal cavity. Now we come to the first part, the first part. Now, the first part of the, again, back to slide number 13. Here is the first part of the maxillary artery. The first part of maxillary artery, so it's partly within the parotidic gland and then leaves the parotid behind the mandible, behind the mandible, deep to the mandible, to enter into the infratemporal fossa, where it becomes the pterygoid part. The first part gives rise, gives rise to five branches. It gives rise first to deep auricular branch, deep auricular, deep auricular branch, which is small branch, enters into the, for, from its name, it's for the supply of the auricle of the ear and the external acoustic meatus. Then it gives rise to another branch, which is a small one not shown here, as anterior tympanic this pass backward and enters into the middle ear, middle ear cavity for the supply of the middle ear, middle ear cavity. Next, within the before it enters into infratemporal fossa, it gives rise to another branch, which is the middle meningeal artery. This is the middle meningeal artery. The middle meningeal artery has very short course in the area and ascends upward, upward to enter through foramen spinosum in the floor of the, or base of the skull, and then supplies the dura, dura matter of the middle cranial fossa, it divides into frontal and parietal, parietal bronze, parietal bronze, the middle meningeal artery lies in the extra dural, dural space. It's for the supply of the meninges of the brain. Next, posterior to it, it gives rise to another branch which is called accessory middle meningeal artery. Accessory middle meningeal artery, again, from its name, this is accessory, so it's not present all the time. Is not present always, is not present always. The middle meningeal, here you see the middle meningeal artery. In this slide, with the anterior tympanic entering in the middle half and the deep auricular artery, which is cut in for the auricle. So, deep auricular, anterior tympanic, middle meningeal, 
middle meningeal artery. This passes you see here between the two roots of the auricular temporal nerve, enters through the foramen spinosum into the cranial cavity. Next, we have the accessory middle meningeal, which is small from its name accessory, sometimes is not present, is not present. And if it is present, this ascends upward again, pass into the middle cranial fossa through the foramen or valley with the mandibular nerve, which descends from, from it. Here is the mandibular nerve emerging from foramen or foramen or valley, and this is the accessory middle meningeal, accessory middle meningeal artery supplying the meninges. So two bronze enter into the cranial cavity, the middle meningeal artery and accessory middle meningeal artery for the supply of dura mater. Two of them are for the ear, one for the external ear, the deep auricular artery for the auricular and external auditory meatus, and the anterior tympanic branch for the supply of the middle ear, middle ear. Now, lastly, the fifth branch of the first part, or the first part of, of the maxillary artery is the inferior alveolar artery. Now, the inferior alveolar artery emerge from the inferior aspect of first part of maxillary artery, opposite the middle meningeal. You see here is opposite the middle meningeal artery. The inferior alveolar artery descend downward, to the inner aspect of the ramus of the mandible and then enters in the mandibular foramina. Inside the mandibular foramina, accompanied by inferior alveolar nerve, you see this is the inferior alveolar nerve and the inferior alveolar artery. Before it enters into the mandibular foramen, it gives rise to enters into the mandibular foramen, it gives rise to branch which descends in the mylohyoid groove below the mylohyoid muscle. <coughs> Sorry. This is the artery to mylohyoid. You see it's, it's dotted because it lies deep to the bone in the mylohyoid groove and then descend to the inferior surface of the floor of oral cavity to the inferior surface of mylohyoid and supply the mylohyoid muscle. Then the artery, the inferior alveolar, enters into the mandibular canal through the mandibular foramen, passes in the mandibular canal inside the mandible, gives bronze for the bone itself, and then reaching to the body, you see it's, it's dotted it's within the mandibular canal, reaching to the body, it starts to give rise to branch, which pass through canals, through canals, small canals for the supply of the teeth. It gives branch for the supply of the last molar. Depending on the number of the roots, it divides into a number of branch for each root, gives an artery which enters through the root canal to supply the teeth. Here again for the second molar, then two, and then the first molar, and then for the second premolar. Now, between the first and second premolar, again, it gives rise to another branch, which emerges from the mental foramen to the surface of the, of the chin. For the supply of skin of the chin, this is the mental branch of it, and then continues as incisor branch, which descent gives rise to another branch for the first premolar, then the canine, and the two incisors. So the inferior alveolar artery supplies all the teeth, the lower teeth, by giving branch passing through the mandibular canal inside the bone and giving, giving dental branch according to the number of the roots. Might give three for the last molar, two for the second, and depending on the roots, usually one for the canine and for the incisors and gives rise to the mental branch which emerges from the mental foramen. In addition, it gives rise to the artery to mylohyoid, which supplies the floor of the oral, oral cavity, the mylohyoid muscle. So this is for the first part. So the, all the lower teeth together with the bone, the mandible, are supplied by the, by the 
inferior alveolar artery in damage or injury to the inferior alveolar artery sometimes might be injured in in fractures of the ramus of the mandible of the mandible and this means loss of blood supply to all our our teeth and might get necrosed necrosed and become dead so the first part gives rise to five fibrons to supply meninges which are the middle meningeal accessory middle meningeal passing through the foramen spinosum and foramen ovale two for the ear one for the external ear and the other for the middle ear deep auricular and anterior tympanic and the branch which supplies all the lower teeth with the mandible and gives rise to the mental branch which supplies skin on the chin and the artery to the mylar ayad which supplies floor of the oral cavity this is the first part from here it leaves the parotid and the mandible to enter into the infratemporal fossa here you see this is the infratemporal fossa this is the lateral pterygoid muscle arising by two heads and passing backward to be inserted into the pterygoid fovea at the neck of the mandible and this is the medial pterygoid which passed to be inserted to the inner aspect of the angle of the mandible these two muscles lies within the infratemporal fossa together with the temporalis the tendon of it which descends here is being cut has become attached to the to the coronary process of the mandible now the second part of maxillary artery which is the pterygoid lies in the infratemporal fossa starts from here to end at the pterygomaxillary fissure either pass superficial to the lateral pterygoid sometimes pass deep to the lateral pterygoid it might be in this slide here here it's usually here deep to the lateral pterygoid together with the mandibular nerve but usually it passes passes superficial to the lateral pterygoid and being the lateral pterygoid separates it from the mandibular nerve which passes lies deep to the lateral pterygoid now the second part again again gives rise gives rise to five five bronze it gives rise to muscular bronze and these are for the muscles of mastication you know we have four muscles of mastication we have the temporalis we have masseter lateral and medial pterygoids <clears throat> now gives rise to deep temporal bronze might be one or two you see here are two and sometimes three the deep temporal bronze these are sent upward to the deep surface of the temporalis muscle for the supply of it next it gives rise it gives rise to artery to the medial pterygoid from the inferior aspect it gives rise to artery to medial to medial pterygoid then it gives rise to artery to the lateral pterygoid muscle here you see supplying it lateral pterygoid another another branch and then it gives rise to a branch to the masseteric masseteric muscle of course because it has been removed from here the masseteric branch is not is not shown it's cut this is the masseteric cut the edge of it this ascends upward and pass over the the mandibular notch of the mandible to the deep surface of the of the masseteric masseteric muscle these are the four muscular muscular branch of the second part of maxillary artery and then lastly it gives rise to a buccal branch this passes passes leaves the, the infratemporal fossa and pass to the cheek to the cheek over the parotid gland and supply skin of the cheek so four muscular branches with one become cutaneous for the supply of the skin of the cheek sorry doctor can i have a question yes so we have like five branches three of them are superior and two are inferior yeah. right three of them they arise from the upper aspect two of them arise from the lower aspect for the first part four of yeah. them arise upward one only the inferior of the other arise from the inferior aspect and the myohyoid as well for the first part of course this is a branch of the yeah. inferior of the other yeah. Yeah. thank you doesn't arise directly from the maxillary it's a branch from inferior of the other before it enters the mandibular foramen 
So this is for the second part of the maxillary artery for muscular bronze for the four muscles of mastication and one cutaneous the buccal for the supply of the skin. From there, it enters through this fissure inside the pterygopalatine fossa. Here is the pterygopalatine fossa, the pterygopalatine fossa, just to remind you, it's a small triangular pyramidal shape with the apex downward and the base upward. The anterior wall of it is formed by the infratemporal surface of the maxilla, the posterior wall of it is formed by the anterior wall of pterygoid process of sphenoid bone, and the medial wall is the vertical plate of, of the palatine bone, palatine bone, and the roof of it is between the sphenoid and horizontal plate of palatine, palatine bone. Now, this contains the third part of maxillary artery, in addition contains the pterygomaxillary sorry, pterygopalatine parasympathetic ganglia with the terminal portion of the maxillary, maxillary nerve. Also, from the foramen rotundum, it's open, enters in the pterygopalatine fossa. So here, the maxillary artery, a third part of it, accompanies maxillary, maxillary nerve. We will study these with the cranial nerves. Now, the last part of the, or third part of the maxillary artery, gives rise to a number of bronze, gives rise to groups of arteries, gives rise to palatine bronze. From that name, this is for the palate, soft and hard palate. Gives rise to pharyngeal branch, which passes to the nasopharynx. Gives rise to a branch of pterygoid canal, which enters inside the middle cranial fossa. Then it gives rise to nasal bronze, nasal bronze, nasal bronze for the supply of nasal cavity, and then continues as infraorbital nerve. So it gives rise to four groups, four groups of bronze, nasal, palatal, pharyngeal, pharyngeal, and <coughs> artery of pterygoid canal with the pterygoid of the middle cranial fossa and then continues as orbital, which is the infraorbital artery. Now the palatal bronze, these are greater and lesser palatine, palatine arteries. This is the greater palatine, these descend in the pterygopalatine fossa, then enters through a foramen in the infratemporal surface of maxilla and appears in the heart palate, in the heart palate at the lesser and greater palatine foramina. These two supply, supply the heart and soft palate. If you remember, the greater palatine passes along the medial border, medial border of the alveolar, alveolar arch in the heart palate to all the incisive, incisive foramen. The two unite with each other, anastomose there, and then continues the anastomose also of the external nasal artery. The lesser palatine passes backward to supply of the soft, soft palate. These are palatal bronze for the hard and soft palate, so they supply the roof of the oral, oral cavity. The nasal bronze, the nasal bronze, we have, we have the sphenopalatine, the sphenopalatine artery, which passes into the mid-lateral wall of the nasal cavity and supply the nasal, nasal cavity, the sphenopalatine with the nasopalatine artery also, the nasopalatine artery. These two supply the nasal, nasal cavity. We have the artery of pterygoid canal. It passes through the pterygoid canal and enters inside the middle cranial, cranial fossa for supply of meninges. Then we have the pharyngeal branch. The pharyngeal branch pass backward through a pharyngeal canal. This is for the supply of nasopharynx, nasopharynx. Only supply nasopharynx, but does it supply the oropharynx? Because the oropharynx is supplied by the ascending pharyngeal artery and the ascending palatine of the facial, facial artery and the tonsillar, tonsillar artery. But the nasopharynx is supplied by the pharyngeal branch of third part of maxillary artery, which enters through the pharyngeal canal to inside the 
the nasal nasal pharynx. Next, the artery continues as the infraorbital infraorbital artery. Emerge as the infra infraorbital artery. Now, the infraorbital artery emerges from the pterygopalatine fossa through the inferior orbital fissure. Here is the inferior orbital fissure and enters in the floor of the orbit in the infraorbital groove and then enters in the infraorbital canal which is this dotted one and then opens opens in the infraorbital foramen at the face below the inferior margin of the orbit midpoint of the inferior orbital margin about one centimeter below Below it, you can feel, feel it, feel it here on the face, on the face, and roll it below your finger. The infraorbital artery emerges from there and divides into three terminal bronze, divides into a palpebral, a nasal, and a labial, labial branch for the upper lip. Now, the infraorbital artery is the main supply for all upper teeth. The inferior alveolar, we said, supplies all the lower teeth with the mandible. Now the infraorbital artery supplies all the upper teeth. The infraorbital artery, before it enters into the infraorbital, inferior orbital fissure to the infraorbital groove, it gives rise to the posterior superior alveolar artery. This is the posterior superior alveolar artery. The posterior superior alveolar <coughs> passes through a canal, through a canal in the foramen, in the infratemporal surface of the maxilla, enters into a canal, and then this gives rise to branches for the supply of upper last molar, upper second molar, upper first molar, and then anastomos with the middle superior alveolar artery. So the posterior superior alveolar is the main supply for the posterior portion of the maxilla with the last molar, the other three molar upper teeth. Then as it enters in the infraorbital groove and canal, in the middle of the canal, it gives rise to the middle superior alveolar artery. This is the middle superior alveolar artery. This passes in a bony canal in the lateral wall of maxillary sinus. Descend there, then to the roots of the tooth. It divides into branches for the supply of premolars and then anastomose with the, with the posterior superior alveolar artery and with the anterior superior alveolar artery. Then the infraorbital artery gives rise to, just before it emerges from the infraorbital canal, to another branch, which is the anterior inferior, anterior superior alveolar artery. This descends in a bony canal at the anterior wall of maxillary sinus, and then divides into branches for the supply of the incisors and the canine, and then anastomos with the middle superior and posterior superior. These three, the anastomosis, they form a ring of arterial arteries above the roots of the teeth. From there, immerse the, the dental branch for the supply of the teeth. So, the infraorbital artery is the main side supply for all upper teeth and upper alveolar arch through three branches, not like the the lower teeth is only inferior alveolar artery for all of them. Here, it gives is infraorbital, but it's through three arteries: superior, posterior, superior alveolar artery, middle superior alveolar artery, anterior superior alveolar artery. They anastomose with each other, and they supply they supply other teeth. So there is anastomosis between these. So, for example, if the anterior superior alveolar is blocked here or injured, then blood supply could come to the incisor teeth through these anastomoses, through this collateral circulation and doesn't get <coughs> dead or necrosed, which is different from the lower teeth. It's only one artery, it becomes blocked completely, then 
This means necrosis of all lower teeth. The same for the middle superior alveolar and posterior superior alveolar. There is an extra route for the supply of the teeth. Finally, <coughs> sorry, the infraorbital artery emerges from infraorbital foramen and divides into three branches. One for the supply of the lower eyelid, its palpebral branch. One pass medially toward the lateral aspect of the nose nasal branch and one descend to the upper lip as the labial labial branch. So this is for the maxillary maxillary artery. <coughs> so by now we have seen that the maxillary artery supplies supplies nasopharynx, nasal cavity, supplies roof of the oral cavity, all upper teeth with the other arch, supplies of course the maxillary sinus through these bronze, supplies all lower teeth, floor of the oral cavity, but doesn't supply the tongue and the salivary glands because these are supplied by the lingual lingual artery and partly by the facial facial artery supplies also part of the external auditory meatus and the auricle and part of the partly to the middle ear middle ear cavity for the blood supply of the teeth so all of them are supplied by two arteries, inferior alveolar artery and infraorbital artery. The inferior alveolar continues to supply all teeth, while the infraorbital gives rise to three separate bronze, one for the three molars, the other for the premolars, and the anterior one for the for the incisors. But these three also they anastomose with each other with each other above the roots of the teeth. <clears throat> so again, branch of the first part, this is horizontal, passes between mandible neck and sphenomandibular ligament, parallel with the auriculotemporal nerve, crosses inferior alveolar nerve to lower border of lateral telecoid. Branch of it gives rise to deep auricular, supplies external acoustic meatus, exterior of tympanic membrane and partly TM joint. Anterior tympanic from its name, inter tympanic cavity through temporal tympanic, tympanic fissure, supplies the middle ear cavity or tympanic tympanic cavity. Then third branch is middle meningeal. This ascends between the two roots of the auriculotemporal nerve to form and spinosum to intermedial cranial fossa, dividing into frontal and parietal branch in cranial cavity. This gives rise to branches for the supply of the ganglionic for trigeminal. This is inside inside the cranial cavity. Petrosal branch supplies facial and greater petrosal nerves, superior tympanic for supply of tensor tympani muscle and temporal branch and then stomating with, with lacrim. Then next we have another branch for the meninges, which is the accessory middle meningeal artery. Intercranial cavity through foramen ovale supplies the meninges. And finally is the branch for the tooth, which is the inferior alveolar or dental artery. This descends posterior to inferior alveolar nerve to mandibular foramen. It lies between bone laterally and the sphenomandibular ligament, which is attached to the lingula of the mandibular foramen. Medially, then it traverses the canal with the nerve and divides into incisor branch, which continues below incisor teeth to midline where it anastomose with its fellow. And then mental branch leaves mental foramen supplies chin and then stomas with submental and inferior labial arteries. In the canal, the inferior alveolar artery supplies mandible tooth sockets tooth with branches entering 
at each each apex of the root for the supply of the pulp of the tea. That's the, what we call it inside the root canal together with the nerve entering inside it and the vein emerging emerging from it and the minute lymphatic. Then the inferior artery gives rise also to two arteries before it enters through the canal, the myelohyoid artery to myelohyoid arise just before it enters into the canal, pierces sphenomandibular mandibular ligament to descend with the myelohyoid nerve in the myelohyoid group in ramus and then ramifies on the inferior surface of the myelohyoid muscle and is the muscle submental or facial. It gives rise to a lingual, the lingual arises near its origin in the sense of the lingual nerve passing behind the lower mother to supply the buccal mucus mucus membrane. Now this lingual lingual branch it descends with the lingual nerve behind the last molar teeth. You can you can last lower of course lower molar too. If you pass your index finger behind your last molar tooth, pass it behind it. You can roll it over and then you can feel the lingual nerve and you might feel this lingual, lingual branch. This is usually the cause of bleeding, bleeding in operations on the last molar, especially when you have an impacted, impacted last molar. Then this with operation you should operate and open so that you can extract the teeth. Sometimes you might injure this lingual artery and lead to, to severe to severe bleeding. And that's why most of the dentists they doesn't operate on this except those who have specialists in maxillofacial surgery. They work on this because of this lingual branch of the inferior alveolar artery which accompanies lingual nerve behind behind the last molar teeth. So this is for the first part. Now coming to the second part, muscular part or the pterygoid part, which this lies within the infratemporal fossa. It gives rise to muscular balance for muscles of mastication, deep temporal, anterior and posterior. Might be three sometimes ascend between temporalis and bone with its deep surface supplying it. Pterygoid bronze, irregular and supply pterygoids, lateral and medial pterygoid, artery to medial pterygoid, artery to lateral pterygoid. Masseteric bronze, small passes through mandibular nose to the deep surface of masseter. And then buccal bronze, this is the only cutaneous one, runs obliquely forward with buccal nerve supply, external surface of buccinator and through the mucosa and skin of the chin. Come to the third part, this is within the pterygopalatine fossa, lies anterior to the pterygopalatine ganglia, accompanied by the maxillary nerve. This gives rise to posterior superior alveolar, leaves the maxillary artery as it enters the fossa, descends on maxillary infratemporal surface, then divides into bronze entering alveolar canals, supply molar and premolar, and the maxillary sinus, some other continue over alveolar process to supply the alveolar arch. <coughs> then we have the Infraorbital artery, this enters orbit, posteriorly through inferior orbital fissure, and then run in the infraorbital groove, and then in canal with corresponding nerve, both emerging on the face of the infraorbital foramen, deep to levator labiae superioris. In the canal, it gives rise to orbital bronze for the supply of the muscles of the orbit and floor of the orbit, rectus inferior, inferior oblique, and lacrimal sac. Gives rise to the <coughs> anterior superior alveolar dental bronze descends via anterior alveolar canal to supply incisor of canine mucus membrane of maxillary sinus. Then on the face, divides into labial, nasal, and palpebral bronze. This is from the infra orbital. In addition to middle superior alveolar artery, 
And then it gives rise to pharyngeal bronze for the nasopharynx, artery of pterygoid canal for the middle, cranial fossa and sphenopalatine for the nose. Now we have finished with the blood supply of the head and neck and then details and details of the teeth. Now what remains is another artery which shares in the supply. If you remember last week we said mostly are supplied by the external carotid artery. Few blood, some blood supply comes from the another branch, another artery, which is the subclavian artery. Again, the subclavian artery extends again the, on the right side, the branch of the brachiocephalic. On the left side, is a separate branch from the arch of the aorta. Extend from sternoclavicular joint to apex of the axilla, and then enters into the axilla to become the heartbreak and the axillary artery for the supply of upper limb. That lies in the supraclavicular triangle of neck, the main artery of the upper limb. Some branch supplying supplying parts in that. If you remember from the thyroid gland, we say it is supplied by three arteries: superior thyroid from external carotid and inferior thyroid. This arises from the thyroid cervical trunk of the thyroid of the sorry of the subclavian for the supply of thyroid gland, pharynx, trachea, and larynx. And gives rise to transverse cervical from costal cervical trunk of the subclavian supply muscular branch, muscular branch for the <coughs> muscular branch for the muscles of the neck. Now the venous drainage of the head and neck. Venous drainage. These most of the veins they accompany the arteries, but we have two sets of veins. You have superficial and deep superficial vein, they drain either to external jugular vein on the neck or to the internal jugular vein. The external jugular vein, this is a small vein, is formed by the union of the anterior and posterior branch of, sorry, by the posterior division of this retromandibular vein with the posterior auricular vein, the two form external jugular which descends over the lateral aspect of the neck superficial to the sternocleidomastoid and then terminates terminates again in the either in the subclavian or in transverse cervical or in the deep in the internal jugular vein then to join the subclavian then the deep veins these all of them they drain into internal jugular vein the internal jugular vein starts from the brain inside inside the cranial cavity where all collects all the venous drainage of the brain all the venous sinuses leaves the cranial cavity through the jugular foramen and descend in the carotid sheath downward till the root of the neck where it unites with the subclavian vein or the subclavian enters in the subclavian vein to form the brachiocephalic cephalic Vein. This is the internal jugular emerging from the skull, descending the neck within the carotid sheath, and then at the root of the neck, it unites with the subclavian to form the brachiocephalic, brachiocephalic vein on the right and left left side. Here is again the internal jugular vein. These these are the venous sinuses inside the cranial cavity. All the blood from these become collected into the internal jugular vein, which emerges from the jugular foramen, pass in the in the carotid within the carotid sheath, accompanied by the internal carotid, and then common carotid to unite with the subclavian to form the brachiocephalic. The internal jugular vein it drains all the veins of the face, the scalp, and the neck. So it drains the maxillary, the superficial temporal, temporal, anterior division of auricular temporal, the facial, the lingual, the superior thyroid, superior thyroid, the middle thyroid, the thyroid vein, with the inferior thyroid vein. All the veins are drained into the internal jugular, jugular vein. So the internal jugular vein drains intracranial structures, that is the brain and the meninges, starts at the jugular fossa, leaves cranium through jugular foramen, 
to enter carotid sheath, drains all veins of the head and neck, the center root of the neck to join the subclavian vein to form the brachiocephalic. Then fill thyroid vein, drain thyroid, and joins usually the, the single vein and drains in the brach left brachiocephalic vein. I'm done for today. Do you have any questions? <coughs> no. No questions? If you don't no. have any questions, you can leave. 